hands. His ankle there, nice, nice kick. kick. He comes Jordan, Jordan back. come back with those hands again. Uh, hey, yo, your boys are back again, live in studio. It's been a while since we were in the studio. I feel like it's been a while. Yes, it has. I feel like the last couple of times I've said it's been a while. <laughs> Where was it? Yeah, it's been a while. Well, you're, like, you're, you're geologically further away from me now. I am a little bit slightly further away. <laughs> and I'm also just a complete fucking shambles. <laughs> I was like, you know, I thought like, you know, because you're not fighting at the moment that like you have more time on you. Oh, uh, yeah. But like we were discussing before we start mm. recording, I am just absolutely fucking awful at like just living a life yeah yeah organizing <laughs> uh, yeah, if you don't have any kind of chaos energy about you you're just, just like you're just not living are you yeah i'm one of the most chaotic people i know mm -hmm. second only to my trainer um, um <laughs> you just bounce ideas off each yeah, other. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um yeah it's funny like because i um uh it's i mean it's like i've had a few people i'm always talking like podcast related mm -hmm. stuff people always come to me with their ideas and stuff and i've just been a bit shambolic lately and I haven't been able to get back to everyone. And like, I, I put something up during the week just mm. to be like, you know, I'm, I'm, and I'm getting back to everyone. And it's been really cool. Like, Cause like, I appreciate that people want to come with their ideas and stuff. So I feel like a bit of a dickhead when I, <laughs> when I can't <laughs> give it full attention, but like, I was like, Hey, you know, just let people know, mm. you know, cause I got a few messages about like, Oh, you've been quiet. And then I was thinking about it. I was like, I haven't been that quiet mm. <laughs> like for a regular person it's really I've, I've been i've been around yeah yeah but um that's more just like tells you how noisy i usually am <laughs> oh well but that's all right but we never expect anything less from you i'm here so, so i'm here and i'm chaotic exactly <laughs> but luckily it's not just us on here it's like we have a guest again lucky for you yeah. it's nice. excellent but let's just get into it so a little bit of a drum roll introduction into it so she trains at srg gym that's led by lewis regis she uh won the award for oz muay thai award for the up and coming female of the year she has a fight coming up on eruption muay thai against erin harbinger and she went four and four like in a very successful campaign in 2022 across the line we have dory duncan how are you today hello hey good thank you thanks for having me on the show thank yeah. you for joining hey, us no worries thanks for coming in now just a very clear from there is like you go by Dory, but <laughs> that's yes. not your first name, is it? <laughs> oh, not this. Yeah, no. Yeah. Not. With the air. <laughs> Don't lie to the listeners. Mm. Yeah. So my first name is uh, Rudy Rek, so it's a Thai name. And then my oh. middle name is Dorian, but that is way too feminine for me. So Dory. And then, yeah, Duncan. So Dory is just because it's easier for everyone. There you Who's go. Back? Official. Yeah. <laughs> and then Hugh gives me shit for, he Ooh. says that I take... You said that I take credit for Rujarek's accompl accomplishment. Yeah. I mean, I'm just, I'm just a confused <laughs> onlooker. Just this is why we need to clear these things up. It's like, a, it's a window in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. You know, especially if you're going to try and get into one, you know, you got to go by that time now. Yeah, yeah. You might have to double down. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I didn't even think about that, hey? There you go. That's free one. That's some branding assistance. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> okay, Dory. So um, first time on the podcast. And so with everyone that gets on the podcast the first time, we want to know your more Muay Thai origin story. So, you know, what got you into Muay Thai to begin with? What were like, yeah, what were your motivations? I always loved martial arts and I always liked um, like watching old Kung Fu like Jackie Chan and all that kind of stuff. Jet Li was a big one for me growing up. I think that was my generation when I was a kid, Jet Li. Romeo must die. And yeah, so I just really loved martial arts. I did like Taekwondo for a long, long time, since like five years old. And then I kind of realized the Taekwondo that I was learning was really watered down <laughs> um, and not actually going to help me defend myself if I got into, like it looks cool, all the forms and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, at like 16, 17, I just kind of lost interest and being, yeah, like I have family in Thailand. I always went back and forth to Thailand to visit and watch the stadium fights. And I was just like, this is amazing. Like I, I want to learn this. I want to be part of this somehow, but I never ever intended to fight. It was just part of my culture. And it, that, I just thought it was beautiful. Mm. Yeah. So, and that's pretty um... much it. Yeah. So well, okay. So you went from there. And so when, when did you decide to take the leap going into Muay Thai itself? It's a funny story. Okay. Oh, is it a funny story? Um, so like, I moved, I'm from Canberra originally, and then I moved out of home at like 18 
I wasn't doing anything. I was just partying heaps. I think this was maybe after a few years living in Sydney and I just walked past this like building on George Street in Haymarket and there was just a paper sign like printed on an A4 piece of paper like real Muay Thai call this number if you want to learn and it was like this really old just typically in a city like terrorist building and I was like that looks legit I'm going to text this number um so that was I don't know if it's still operating or not but that gym was called Muay Thai Temple yes. so yeah like Tuck he was one of the he's still pretty active in the Australian Muay Thai scene he was my main trainer there um, but he wasn't the number. The number was um, Bullen, who was the owner. So, um, yeah, I just started doing PTs with them there and really loved because everyone was Thai and it was in pretty much Thai town. So I was away from my parents and away from home Canberra, but then I felt like I was still experiencing my culture. So, yeah, stayed there for like four years or longer, maybe five. But um, it was just more of like a fitness and Muay Thai kind of gym, not a fight gym. So hence the move to SRG later on yeah and um we'll get to kind of like the move to srg and stuff and and your your current career because it has really kind of especially in the last 12 months i feel sort of skyrocketed but i'm interested i find your story really interesting in in kind of um dorian i've met before um in speaking to you um (laughs) since i've known you so you talk about move like like having have just just for our, our listeners that are a little bit less aware of your story. You talk about um having family in Thailand and home being Canberra, being originally mm-hmm. from Canberra. But you were born in Thailand, mm. right? Correct. Yeah, yeah, Bangkok. Yeah. So in terms yeah. of like, I, I find it interesting that um a lot of people would expect um you know a, a Thai national to you know kind of like you know have it in the blood a little bit and and we, we know that that kind of typical origin story of a a Thai born Thai boxer is to start quite young but your introduction mm. to martial arts was very kind of like western like you like the kung fu movies and started in kind of like the taekwondo yes. so why do you feel you weren't kind of more inclined to start like Thai boxing at a young age as opposed uh, to not many if, other um, arts? well because I I was born there, but I lived there until I was maybe four yeah. and then was raised in um, Canberra. So also none of my family did Muay Thai. Like yeah. they watch it on TV and everything, but no one was really involved with the Muay Thai scene. They just liked watching it. So I wasn't exposed to it any time that I went to Thailand other than when I specifically would ask, oh, can we go watch the Muay Thai at the stadium? Mm-hmm. Um, and that was it. Um, and most Thai pe- people that I have encountered other than in the Muay Thai scene, they're not really super involved in the sport, uh, mm-hmm. especially females. It's not really something that if you have a choice, you're going to do in Thailand. Yeah. It's yeah. not something you're going to pursue, yeah, as a career. Maybe now, now it's different because obviously we have a lot more exposure. But, yeah, when my when my relatives in Thailand learned that I was fighting and competing, they were like, what? Why? Like, your mum moved you to Australia. Yeah. And raised you like Western so you could get like this education and or everything and you've chosen Muay Thai. Yeah, and, and that is an interesting kind of thing to kind of discover when you go over to Thailand. I, I might have told this story on the podcast before. I remember the first time I was in Thailand, I was in a taxi and I was mm. chatting to the driver and he was asking me about like, you know, why have you come to Thailand? And I said, I came here for, for Thai boxing. I want to do mm. Muay Thai. And then he's asking me lots of questions about where I live. And, um, you know, is there street food in Sydney? And I said, oh, like, <laughs> not really. Uh, there's more like, you know, restaurants. Go, oh, so you got like a bunch of restaurants where you live. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, there's <laughs> lots of restaurants. He goes, so why do you do Muay Thai? Why don't you just become a chef? And I was like, no, I, I wow. do Muay Thai. I do Muay Thai for fun. Uh, not, yeah. It's not my work. I have another job. And he was kind of like, oh, righto. That's stupid. <laughs> okay. He's like, wow, it must be nice to have so many <laughs> options. Yeah. So it is, um, yeah. you know, it's, it's a different life over there. Absolutely. But I'm really interested to get your take on what's it like to kind of, you know, you mentioned you found Muay Thai from a phone mm. number on a wall, which is, you know, that's a risky game in any case. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> text, yeah. Texting the number written on a wall ended up um, having a positive outcome. Um, what's it yes. like for yourself to kind of, I guess, 
from the outside discover what is your national art um you know your the, the art of your family does it is it kind of like did you feel like kind of culturally connected to Muay Thai or do you do you kind of yeah. adopt it in the same way you know another Australian person would what, what was that kind of like I felt really real I think also because I was introduced by Thai all Thai people yeah um to the sport um I, I it's actually something that I constantly I'm I get emotionally really invested in it um and so even when I'm training or just shadow boxing or especially why cool when I'm doing the runway like I get very very emotional I might not show it but it, it means a lot to me because I really want to represent my culture and like this is our national sport but it's not just our sport it's like thousands hundreds of years of heritage mm-hmm. you know um yeah it was used for self-defense in war not as just a spectator sport you know I'm pretty sure <laughs> I'm pretty sure but yeah so yeah. Uh, I have a, I feel I have a really really deep connection um every kick every punch everything that I throw I it, it's because I'm so proud to be Thai and be doing Muay Thai yeah yeah so so did you kind of feel like that process of discovering Muay Thai and starting to train and starting to fight kind of made you closer to, to your heritage kind of like brought you closer to to you know that, hmm. that side of your family Yes, definitely. Um, I was always close to that side. I'm really close to, well, I'm close to both parents, but I'm really close to my mum yeah. anyway. Um, but then there's just a lot of things that come with Muay Thai, as you both would know. There's a lot of customs, just little things like being respectful. Yeah. You know, um, why your your pad holder like bounds your pad holder saying thank you before and after. Little things like that, that like those are little attitude shifts I think you can carry into life. Yeah, Not absolutely. Just to be grateful and yeah, be courteous to everyone and be fucking humble because there is always a Thai trainer with 400 plus fights that is going to just get you off your high horse. Yeah. <laughs> no matter how good you think you are, like, no. Nah. So going from like, you know, moving on from Thai Temple, um, and now you're at SRG and that's where you base all your fighting career from. Like, so mm. like, why? Why SRG of all places from there? Was that something like location wise or did you search out a bit? Especially they got a, a lot of great Thai trainers there with Lewis Regis as well. Yeah. Um, so I think some of our trainers at um, Muay Thai Temple were kind of like half, half, Pat holding at SRG and half half at Muay Thai Temple because Muay Thai Temple was so small. Mm. They didn't really need that many trainers. So a few of them, yeah, were spending more time at SRG anyway. Um, and then starting to fight for SRG. And I just I just really liked that, even though it was operated and run by non-Thais, um, like it seemed that Lewis really respected all the customs and cultures of Muay Thai and really wanted to preserve and keep it as Muay Thai, not a Muay Thai slash boxing slash mm-hmm. whatever gym. Um, that's what really attracted me to it. Mm-hmm. And I love like I've I've watched, followed Lewis for like a long time and mm-hmm. love his fight style. So yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah, and at mm. the moment it seems like um the stable like especially like with the girls there like you got yourself Allegra, um Mariana as well like it's a really strong female team that you got there and also mixing with like with i guess with the teens helps as well like you know kale and adam and Mm -hmm. james also it's like yeah it's like how do you find what's the training environment like at srg right now it is so good it's so so good when i like first start made the proper shift to srg full-time i think um the girls that were there there weren't that many um fighters and then i think they were kind of at the end of their career so they were dropping off with their training so I started when the boys were still like Kale and Sing Dum and stuff. I think they were still like 16. Um, so it was really good because we were kind of the same physical stature. Um, but now those boys are just, man, they, they're they just getting better and better at lightning speed. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really good now because I have, like you said, Allegra, Marina. There's also some amateur girls um, that are putting in a lot of work too so it's really cool to see over the years the female fight team growing uh but training with the the young boys like they're amazing man they're so inspiring and they're not just good athletes they have really good attitudes and they're good people as well like when I was that age I was not that nice of a person (laughs) and I was pretty selfish and not focused you know 
Um, you guys have met the boys. Like they're so polite, so respectful. Yeah. Um, Tweet very boys. humble. Yeah. But uh, My overall, I was actually saying you step wrong, but. Oh yeah, I'm pretty sure I was concussed like recently. <laughs> Very recently. Um <laughs> maybe still now. Um you and me I was back. actually saying to someone that someone said, I don't know, I think they asked like what the what's what it's like or have you seen how much you've improved in the last year at SRG? And then I was like, honestly to me, I don't see my improvement because Every all my training partners, not just the boys, all the or Allegro or Marino, or, you know, everyone, the level right now is so high of all mm. my training partners. I never feel like, you know, a big fish in a small pond. I feel the exact opposite all the time. So because the level is so high, you're just you're just constantly like trying to get better and better and better. You don't feel like you've peaked. Yeah. Because everyone is just so good. And we all just beat the crap out of each other without fail every week. It's never easy. And that's so important in a high performing stable, right? Like I think one of the worst things you yes. know, really that can happen to a fighter is you can kind of um, become comfortable in your environment. Like there is really, and like you see this, of course, you need quality trainers, but you know, mm. like no one thrives more than a fighter who is coming up surrounded by equally kind of hungry driven fighters and and that is i mean i I guess that's something that's something it will be interesting to talk about as well like it can almost be hard to gauge your own improvement when everyone around you is kind of making it feel because like really if your stable is i mean and tell me what you think of this if if you agree like if your stable is strong you probably won't feel like you're improving that much because everyone else is is coming up at the same time, so mm. it's kind of like, mm. like you know, fucking getting nowhere. And like, you can always see the people around you improving, mm. more than you. You can't really like. It's it's a lot more difficult to see your own improvement. Your your only measure is how you perform again. You know, amongst the people around you, and when they're all getting better, it can kind of like Correct. disguise that feeling. So yeah, I guess like um, talk about what that's like. I guess like being in you know surrounded by so many high end fighters and and kind of. Mm gauging your improvement there it's really hard um that's something that i struggle with constantly also being really um i guess i'm a perfectionist Mm -hmm. in every little thing that i throw right so without even paying attention to what all my training partners are doing i'm already looking at myself being like oh no that like that jab was like "Uh, let's do that again another 20 times until it looks perfect so then take that out of the equation and then I'm seeing bloody Kale throw kicks like like the hardest kicks I've ever seen and he's only like 54 kilos or something you know what I mean like and offensively tall. um yes yes <laughs> uh, offensively. hey you are a little bit too me no what yeah that, that kid's more than me and he's like 12 kilos it's like seven foot two yeah. and 54. <laughs> Everyone's just fucking tall. And he's still, he's still growing, man. It's nuts. Um, But, you know, like you have all your teammates telling you all the time, like, well, I'm really lucky that my teammates are so encouraging. They're always like, wow, you look so good on pads. Or like, you look so strong this fight camp. But like, at the end of the day, you have to believe that yourself. Like, yeah. you can't wait for other people to tell you you're good or you you know what I mean like you you just need and another thing that I'm learning to do is when people compliment you to take it on board not dismiss it Mm. so when people say wow that fight was really good or whatever instead of being like oh yeah I didn't really like it but thank you I have to yeah yeah just accept it thank you you're the same right yeah yeah, you'd think like a year of four fights, four wins, you'd be like, I, of course I'm happy. Like, I'm really happy. I've worked really, really hard to pull, to do that. I didn't yeah. even think that was going to happen. But when I look at each of those fights, I see so many things that I'm like, oh, like, <laughs> I just wish I did this. I wish I did this. Why didn't I? Oh, I only won because of this. Yeah. And yeah. it's a good thing to be that way, but you also need to use it in a constructive way. Yeah, that's a um, it's going like I heard. Uh, I might get it slightly wrong, but I just because I have a similar thing, um, and like mm. I've had conversations with 
Yeah, like I've, I've I've done okay. Like you know, I've had some times when yeah, like I, I had some good fights and whatever. But like I I was having a conversation with one of my training partners a couple of months ago, um, where um they were like, "You've come far enough for me to see." that like nothing's mm. ever going to make you like, yep, that was a good one. Mm. It's always going to be like, <laughs> you know, yeah, you could always do more, but at this point, like you've done enough for me to be able to recognize that, like you're never going to be like, yeah. And like, that's what like, it was, um, <laughs> like, and, and the person I was talking about, like you'll stress yourself to death because mm. it's like the, every time, if every time you achieve anything, all that, that like, mm. you know, anytime you, and that, that's kind of like where it, you know, it can be that the pressure can sometimes come from is every win is actually just an avenue to go further. So mm. you start to see line of sight to, to what could potentially be in the pipeline. And that can be kind of terrifying because you get that kind of like, you know, it, there, there can be that imposter yeah. syndrome that like, oh, but what happens if I go mm. to the the next, rather mm. than like, you know, that productive kind of like, okay, I've, I've knocked mm-hmm. this one over and thus I am ready to progress to the next step. Correct. That's all it is. It's progression. It's yeah. But then we add pressure and oh, I did this in my last fight. So now people are expecting this. Like Yeah, that's yeah. Especially because and I think this is a conversation we've had um with a couple of guests because um like I think the level of female Thai boxing in Australia right now is absolutely unreal. And like I'm really lucky to yes. be quite good friends um with a lot of great fighters such as yourself. Um, you know, like such and like, an ally. We love you. <laughs> we love an ally. We do. Blue to Muay Thai League on his birthday. Muay Thai League all female card. Love that. Yeah, and what a way to spend your birthday. And what a card it was. That was a great event. Yeah, yeah. Really amazing. Really Sorry, event. yeah. I but, interrupted um, your No, I needed that. Um <laughs> what, uh, <laughs> what we see a lot of the time, and this is one of the reasons that um I find so many of our female fighters so impressive is that like you take these massive leaps without really having oftentimes the opportunity to rack up of a lot of experience. And I mean, like when someone at your level or, um, you know, like Diandra and and Davina are both great examples too. They emerge Mm -hmm. as these really strong fighters, but when you've had kind of, a dozen fights in Australia at, at like a, a reasonably high level that becomes quite a lot. Like it's where I, like yes. blokes can go away and have across amateur and professional 20, 30, 40 fights and have these busy years. Um, you do kind of get a, a lot of spotlight quite quickly. And, and I do feel that's kind of like what last year was, for yourself, because you think about Thai boxing and, and kind of Correct. the of it, yeah. it's all about experience, rack up tons and tons of fights. But you had this big four fight stretch where, you know, you mm-hmm. fought on Muay Thai League, you fought on 17, 74. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, it's kind of like the, your kind of notoriety in the scene. And this is um, due in part, of course, to like, you're, you're quite good at promoting yourself and stuff as well. But you have a couple of performances and like, it, it's, it's almost like you make, years worth of progress like, like it's it, it it is really sort of sped up and mm. that can be as cool as that is it's also like mm. something to deal with right because you don't have that buffer yes. of being able to spend years and dozens of fights getting your feet under you it kind of just happens all of a sudden so no yeah falls yeah, to walls talk through, talk through 150%. What that's like. <laughs> yeah <laughs> um you know, I actually um, just had a flashback of my pro debut, which you um, commented, commentated. You've both commentated a few of my fights. Um, but I remember watching it back. And I, first of all, never thought I was going to go pro. Um, and then when I listened to you commentating, you and um, John Miller were talking about like, oh, so who's next for Dory? Do you think like Tiff Lamb, Nat Pavlidis? And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, mm, I've, yeah, it's my, it's my first pro fight. Like, and these are girls that I've been watching fighting for years. Um, so it goes back to what you said, like first pro fight, but then already in the same conversation as these yeah. girls who are, you know, they've gone for like national titles and things like that. So it's really, really cool as a female to be able to do that. Um, it's also cool because 
the level is still quite high, even yeah. though, in my opinion, the level of skill, even though maybe the women haven't had as many fights, like 30, 40, 50. When I, like, I've trained with Diane, I've, I've trained with, you know, I've sparred those girls and some other women in the sport, like, really still clean technique when they spar, when they fight, it's like their fight IQ is more than 10 fights or 12 fights, you know? Um, I don't know why that is, but it's, I think it's just forces you to just fucking take it to that next level and start thinking like, okay, I am a professional athlete. Mm. I can do this. I've got this. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a lot. Um, I think I just kind of, Muay Thai League, uh, the all thing I cut last year, that was where mm. it started for me. And I was like, all right, I'm just going to go. I, I'm turning 33 this year. Um, so last year I was turning 32 and I was like, okay, I haven't got as long as I'd like in this sport. So let's just, while my body's good, while I'm feeling healthy, I'm feeling fit. I've got trainers that are investing so much energy into my growth. Every opportunity, just say yes. Like, and I remember um, listening to Kaylee Reese in an interview say something similar because she started later in the sport and mm -hmm. like, look at what she achieved. Mm -hmm. So that was, that's it's still now is um, what is in my mind. I'm just, every opportunity, I'm, I'm grabbing it. And every opportunity to recover between fights because I may not always be having the biggest gap and I'm like it would be cool to hear your input as well Hugh because you had a very very active couple of years um just keeping everything going and keeping it running smoothly so that you can perform again, again as often as possible yeah 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 and I mean like I know you're you've got like quite an interesting lifestyle in terms of like you kind of have got like a couple of day jobs right like you don't have that um mm -hmm. that kind of more typical like work for the day and then going to training and routine like you, you got i mean like maybe like like for the listeners sake well what's kind of a day look like for you before we kind of circle back to that point man every day is so different um goes to kind of what you were saying before like chaos, chaos. love the chaos i chaos. don't want structure <laughs> um so <laughs> Typical day. Okay, so roughly I'll work like 20 ish, 20 to 30 hours retail mm -hmm. um, at Lacoste. That's suits. why I love track suits track so suits. much. Athleisure, we are all about athleisure. All in about life. that. <laughs> athleisure and sneakers, if we're not talking about Muay Thai. Speaking my language um, 100%. Yes. And uh, personal training as well. So I, I, I got a qualification. Um, as a as a personal trainer just before lockdown actually so I do like I'll do like 10 to 20 hours with that and then 20 hours retail sometimes I'll do like events work if I really feel like just adding more <laughs> sit into my day um but I can't I can't do a nine to five I can't sit at like one location for nine yeah. hours or eight hours I can't do it and I can't sit I always have to be yeah yeah standing moving around yeah so yeah a typical day uh for example would be maybe wake up go to training in the morning if i'm not working at so say say i've got training in the evening like fight training where the ties hold pads for us and everything so then in the morning i would get up and do my running and my weights i might also have like one or two pt clients even earlier before that so like at five six and then i'll do my weights my running at the gym and then I'll go to Lacoste and work the retail job for like five, six hours and then go to train at night and then pass out and kind of repeat that in a different order for the next six days, for, for yeah. about six days a week, yeah. So it's, it, it's not like kind of routinely structured. It's sort of like bits and pieces nah. in, in reverse order. Yeah. So in some days will order. be like, some might be like, even like a 12 hour work day actually because yeah. i've just got clients across clients across them training and then some days might only be five hours and then i give myself a chunk of time to nap in the day so there is i do like having that freedom to move things around yeah if yeah, i need so to yeah it's a few plates to keep spinning but as you say like uh that's possibly the benefit of having like a couple of different gigs is the the flexibility of being able to take out move around yeah different pieces rather than having a, a structured nine to five kind of arrangement where yes. it's a little bit less flexible. Yeah. yeah. It is nice to have structure and like a set amount of money 
that you know is coming in though. So, and annual leave. I don't have annual leave or sick leave. Yeah, that's tricky. So that's usually like if there's any public holidays or like weekends, I'm just used to working weekends most of the time. Like it's not even a thing to me anymore. Because now I don't really have any, I don't party anymore because I'm always in flight camp. So it's yeah. not a thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Before I would just party and then, yeah, work and just survived on a lot of sausage and egg McMuffins, oh. I think, from the ages of 18 to 25. <laughs> Breakfast for champions. So, yes. Um, I guess kind of uh, staying uh, to, to a couple of points. So you're doing a little, uh, a bit of personal training. Um, mm-hmm. that, that's kind of one of your gigs. Is the plan ever to kind of like, you know, make Thai boxing your sole source of income, kind of work as a trainer? Or is that was that a reasoning behind becoming a personal trainer in the first place? Correct. Or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, I also because I my first few fights as an amateur. I was like the first female, I'm pretty sure that they had trained and they hadn't trained that many fighters, uh, especially not here. So there was a lot of trial and error in that process. Like I fought at a really light weight that I, I mean, it was no one's fault. We just were all like, kind of like, oh yeah, all right, you can fight at this weight, let's try. Mm -hmm. Like I fought at like 53 or 54, like I could never now. Um, So just a lot of things like that, or like, you know, in Muay Thai, we have to do push-ups between rounds and squats. Like I didn't know how to do all that stuff properly. Mm-hmm. I didn't know how to engage my core when doing 200 sit-ups a day. So I also went and did the PT course because I wanted to learn for myself, like yep. mm-hmm. how to do all these functional exercises properly and not keep getting injured and have and back did you pain deal from with doing a kind of a lot of injuries before that. Yeah, all the time, yeah. all the time. Yeah. I had I had no concept of like sleep recovery, stretching, nothing. And then I started falling in love with just the everyday process. And and then when I got more confident to teach other people, I really loved that process and seeing how how rewarding it was for them to do something they never thought they could do. Yeah. Um, like like Muay Thai. So yeah, I definitely down. I originally was like, yeah, I'll open up my own gym one day, one day, whenever, wherever, don't know where. But then my main thing. Uh, as I started to learn PT and started to get clients through lockdown and stuff, I was like, okay, I need to make a name for myself mm-hmm. before I can have this business because who's going to like, I, d- I don't want to be just some gym where it's just some chick like, oh yeah, kickboxing fitness. Like mm-hmm. I'm Thai. I want to teach Muay Thai and I want the people that come to me to learn real Muay Thai. Um, and yeah, so I just thought I have to build some credibility behind my name before I do that. Yeah, and obviously doing a fantastic job of that um, recently. Um, Thank you. So, I mean, I guess you talk about kind of learning, like we've now touched upon your schedules, super busy. Um, you talked about learning a little bit more about recovery practice and and training a little bit smarter perhaps. So mm. to come back to your point about, you know, career longevity, I guess, is is the overarching thing. You're trying to take steps to make sure you can get as much out of yourself while staying busy and, and being active, kind of like what have been the key learnings there and and what have you implemented to make sure you can always give your best? Sleep. Sleep, yeah. <laughs> Sleep, still struggle with that. Yeah, me too. Some days really, really good, yeah. Other days not so good. Um, I think the timing of my meals, so I – I actually, yeah, I think the reason behind like why I was able to achieve what I could in the previous years because I outsourced mm-hmm. to people that knew what they were talking about. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I invested in strength and conditioning at Ethos. I invested Ethos, yeah. in, you know, working with um, Christoph, the dietitian. Yeah. Um, and you know, going to I went I go to the Cairo like every week, every two weeks because it just keeps everything <laughs> moving the way mm-hmm. that it should um yeah so the main thing was learning how to feel yourself between training sessions for me Mm -hmm. so now I don't really like you're still dead in training like if you're giving it everything you're still going to feel a bit dead but I just the point of it I don't feel yeah but I don't feel weak I still feel like okay I'm fueled yeah and a lot of that is because he he taught me heaps like through this process of um yeah and and yeah taking time for yourself so like sleep is 
good for rest, but other, there's other ways to rest as well, right? So, like, I don't know. My my thing is, like, going for a coffee and journaling. Because yeah, like when that. I've done that, yeah, um, we go to the same spot, Hugh and we I. We do, and that's what I do there as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's what you do too, yeah? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. sometimes you feel more rested and ready to take on whatever you have to take on after doing that than, an, than a bit of sleep or a yeah. nap. Mm-hmm. yeah um, you touched on a couple of concepts there that that i really like and i think um like before i forget to go back to it i love your use of the word outsourcing and uh, mm-hmm. that's something i've been talking to a lot or you know we've got a funny kind of setup at sisoton um yeah. these days in that it's kind of like myself and then sort of on oh, no, a rosie's back on the scene now so she's she's great. i really like yeah i'm liking the you know the female come up now in your gym yeah cool yeah yeah the, the um yeah kayla and rosie are both um are both awesome but uh, yeah. it's, it's cool like I, I knew i knew rosie through the scene like before i, I knew her sort of person mm-hmm. so it's quite cool to see like you know she had a lot of fights before i'd even started mm. and then she kind of took her break and I started and I racked up a whole bunch of fights. Now she's kind of, it's, it's, uh, I mean, not to sidetrack too much. It's, it's funny that like, I don't think, I think I was there when she fought Yolanda. And, um, did she I, fight Yolanda? I didn't even know that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, <laughs> Rosie's been around. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I, I say this a lot. I, I, um, it's a funny thing when Rosie, she was kind of like knocking around the gym, but she's, she's quite unassuming. Um, you mm, know, she's not one yes. to kind of walk in and be like, oh, I've had, dozens of fights so um you know she was around the gym for a long time before she kind of decided to make her comeback and i was often saying to like because our fighters back to the the original point are all quite new and i was like mm-hmm. none of you even know who rosie is like she, yeah. you don't realize who's here she's like, an og man yeah, yeah, yeah she, so she really, really is. coming in like a sleeper yeah <laughs> yeah um um yeah so so she's um kind of a back on the scene now, but, but the, it has been a little bit of a, you know, it's, uh, I'm much, much more experienced like the, our generation of, of fighters are kind mm-hmm. of like a, a new crop, but, and that's one, something I often sort of talk to them about is like, they have so many questions as like, as you will, when you're a new fighter is how do you manage this and this? And then like, it, it is, that's always the answer is like, you can look at a, a fighter who's at that kind of more professional level and is a bit more dialed in and feel like they know about nutrition and they know about strength and conditioning mm. and they know about when really like that is the best lesson you can learn is like there is too much like you have to be a little bit too of a much like you have to learn to understand yeah. your needs athletically and things like that yes you'll learn but do not try to carry like to to uh, learn and implement everything yourself because there is no. not enough time in the day. Figure out what you need to do. Who is the person that you need to speak to about that? Yeah. Figure out like, you know, who's trustworthy and trust them, right? Like in yeah. the same way that you trust your trainer with your technical um, yes. teaching, yep. trust the strength and conditioning coach with thousand percent. conditioning. And, and like um, it, it is such a great, concept of just because it's so much lower pressure as well like and i was i was yeah. actually it's, it's funny that you bring it up because I, I was i was using the word outsourcing in the gym this week when um <laughs> i was giving one of my lectures i like i'd outsource more if i could like I me too everything. Like, <laughs> because, like, you know i've got to turn up to the gym in the morning and then i've got to go and do my day job during the day and then yes. i've got to turn up that's where i need to be on is like training working training i yeah. Don't give a fuck about where my food comes from as long as it's the right food. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like I don't want to necessarily, I think like we can also as athletes, like there's almost this obsession with like productivity. It's like, look at me. Now I'm in the kitchen making a fucking blueberry smoothie. Fuck. Look, if, if that can just be <laughs> in the fridge waiting to go, sick. Like whatever <laughs> gives me more time to train and to yes. sleep. Amazing. My time, everyone's time is fucking precious. Back. Like, and I am no expert. I don't know shit about a lot of this stuff and I don't have the time to learn it or the energy. So I'm going to give it to the experts. I yeah. see myself, right, as like in my mind, I'm like, okay, I'm like this car. <laughs> and then it's just I've got like all these different like mechanics and whatever, whatever else is involved with making a car operate to, yeah, I just rock up. They tell me what to do. 
put all the good stuff in. Okay. And then I'm off like repeating that process, yeah. but I'm not questioning. Well, you know, it is good to ask questions, but like, I am not the expert. So whatever you tell me to do and it's working for me. So I'm just going to do it. <laughs> yeah. And that's like, just do the research required to know who's worth listening to. And then listen. Correct. Yes. Right? And that's, yes. um, and I guess there's sort of like a couple of points. Um, we can kind of, but I mean, I, I guess the, the, the learning for me has always been like more effort does not necessarily indicate a better job. No. Uh, and what I mean by that is like, like I often sometimes kind of like struggle to not be going a million miles an hour all the time because that's mm-hmm. what I'm used to doing. And so that mm-hmm. in my psyche is associated with, doing things the right way. Like, you know, if you're doing a good job, that mm. means you're like in hyperdrive at all time. When what I've been learning, especially the last couple of years is like, if you can take something off your plate and you can just be chilling, yeah. that's a good thing. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, 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 like I struggle. It's very not, hard. Like, yeah. yeah. Because you are used to, I don't want to say the struggle because we're doing what we love. So I don't, I don't, I can't find the right word for it. I guess like, Fight camp, especially, you're always overcoming some sort of adversity. That's why, that's what we're addicted to. We see growth in ourselves. We see ourselves progressing. Um, By no means should, I don't think fight camp should ever be easy, but I think, like you said, take pressure and load off yourself where you can and be smart. Yes. Um, And that is a conflict as well with having a Thai training background. Yeah. Because yes. you yeah. have these amazing trainers. They have so much knowledge. They know um, Smoke and Joe said this, and I will never forget it. Like they, they'll forget more than we'll ever know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I by no means question their ways of training because look at where it's like it's obviously working for me. Like if they've done an amazing job with me. But I remember at the start, just volume meant more. Yeah. as opposed to effort right but the thing is a lot of us we started late in life so our bodies are not accustomed to mm. that volume of training so a lot of injuries were happening for me anyway when I first started um and only in the last few years I've learned like okay I don't I can't actually do a 10k run and then go to training mm. I can only if I if I plan to have like a really heavy like sparring pad work and then heavy bag session and like perform well in that I can, I'll do a 20 minute run, but yeah. run well and then sit, like try and improve my pace in that 20, 15 minutes. Um, Cause my hips, my calves, like they just yeah. can't, they can't even like lift to hit the pad after <laughs> more than that. Yeah. And, and that but it's a shame that it's like trial and error. You have to obviously get injured and stuff to learn, <laughs> to learn that along the way. Yeah, definitely. And I think, um, you know, the, I think the biggest thing that you learn across a career is that there's always going to be external kind of influences and in, in, you know, the key one being, you know, uh, as close as you are to your trainer, it's still external. They're not feeling what you feel. And, and there's a lot of mm. things in that. It's like, it becomes about communicating. Like yeah. it is that classic tie thing, like go and run 10 Ks and you're like, well, like my knee's not really feeling super good today. And, and it's mm. difficult to, you know, you don't want to come across as appearing lazy and, and that can be Mm. a mental game within yourself. And I tell you uh, the biggest problem, you know, I've, I've faced across my entire career is doing things that actively worked against me because I felt like it was a thing to do, not necessarily for my own good, but to live up to an expectation. And that's where it's like, you have to have your training in line with, you know, the, the goalpost is set and you've got to kind of tick those things off, but you also have to be constantly self-assessing and saying, yes. like, okay, is this going to do me any good? Cause the amount of times like I'm getting out of bed at four 30 in the morning because you know, everything hurts and I'm just going out mm-hmm. trying to do whatever. And it's like, am I doing this because it's going to make me better or am mm. I doing this because I think I need to live in a fucking Rocky montage? Like that's the, yeah. That balance and you're beating like, a dead horse, but you don't yeah, even realize yeah. it because yeah. you're just living. You li- when you're in it, you don't realize. You don't have that perspective. And and you you made a point earlier that that I really like, and you said like you kind of we as fighters become kind of addicted to a, a level of struggle, and this mm. has been a, a, like a reflection that I've been having, especially 
recently is that like mm-hmm. fighting is a struggle. Like if you are going through a fight camp, there is always going to be like showing up and, and training properly, especially I know the way mm-hmm. that you guys train at SRG or like, you know, like I train with Chet, for example. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. And that it's like, I think when you, when you start, you're like, okay, the first thing you have to learn is like how to kind of meet that, that demand. And then yeah. like the trap we can fall into as fighters is feeling like we always have to accentuate struggle. Like we go, okay, I, you know, fight camp is our struggle and that's how you, mm. you improve. So you kind of set out to make everything a little bit more of a struggle. And that's like, it's a fine line, right. Between being, being like setting out a hard to, cause that that's been a problem just, you know, It'll be insight into my that's No, important. no, no. It's it's interesting to hear how every fighter um approaches it, I think, as well. Yeah. Um, some people fucking love it. They love just yeah. being like, yeah, like fight down, just get through the hard shit. Like I people love that. Some people love that. And that's like I, I feel depends. like you have to be concentrating the struggle, right? So rather than being like show up to training at 6 p.m. or whenever you start training. And really graft it out and really create that struggle to to meet what the the demands of the training session. Mm. But then learn after that to kind of switch back off and do the same tomorrow rather than, you know, it would really suck if now I went and did something else and I turned that session yeah. from four hours into three hours and stuff. Yeah, like yeah. It's like, yeah. You, I guess. And then go can't. home and just make the whole 48 hours or a whole week a struggle. Suddenly yeah. the whole week, the whole six, eight weeks is a struggle. Instead of, yeah, like switching off after training, going home, not trying to make things harder for yourself, another, add another two hours to your training. Yeah. And, and actually, that's... that's another, actually, sorry, you go. No, no, you go, you go, you go. That was another thing I meant to mention. I outsource um, like mental performance coaching. Yeah, so, I wanted to ask about this. Yeah. So um, Mark, Mark, he, Mark Edmondson, so he, he said something to me because he he played like international level um, rugby in the yeah. UK. Um, and he was like, you know, one thing I have to say to you is like, I wish when I look back on my career, I really wish I stopped, breathed and enjoyed a lot more of those moments instead of just grinding, 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 grinding all the time. Like, this is what, like, why the fuck are we doing this? We're meant to love it. We it's love meant it, to be yeah. done with love, yeah. right? It's not meant to be like, oh, training oh I've got to get this done or oh I'm going to get killed again and it is really easy to just be in that constant spiral of like oh fight camp oh cut weight cut like you know yeah um and he so something that really helps me is he says like when you get into the gym fucking leave your bags at the door like leave as soon as you enter that and I still struggle with it like I am in I'm seven days out from a fight so this is that now the time that your mind really plays yeah, those yeah those emotional and mental games. So I have been struggling with that again. Um, but it's good to have like those mental cues like, oh, okay, I'm starting to get a bit more angry at, for no reason. Or like someone just asked me for the fifth time, am I fighting? Even though it's on the board. <laughs> Dory fighting blah, blah, blah in seven days. Okay, so I need to just be more aware of like, leave my bags at the door, turn up, don't take things as personal. Mm. And then when I'm done with training, get the fuck out. And there is other stuff in life as well, not just yeah. fight camp. Yeah, that's um, that's something I've never been super good at as well. Well, now that's that time for you, right? Like you've, you're you having a little bit of a break. Does it feel like a break or are you just like, what am I doing? Um, Look, honestly, it's less than probably something like I, I, sh- I should talk about it because it's, it's not... Um, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's probably one to park for a different time, but I, I've been having a pretty difficult time with it, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, because there is that. It's really fucked up. It's so fucked up because we associate, I think we associate a lot of our worth as fighters with the fight and with competing. And yeah. when that's gone, you, like, what do you have that drive to attach to? Yeah. I'm not and sure. That- like, I can't speak for you and your experience, but I know that that's, how yeah, I know. I, know. I think it's. Happens. I think it's like a. Again, yeah. This is probably something I should do. I probably won't. I think you should do a session. Like, yeah. Hold me. Hold me accountable. Cause you're <laughs> sure, like, yeah. Sure. Is that um? Yeah. No, that would be a good one because I just think it's like, especially when you start like like quite young. Like you know, I don't even know when my first fight was, especially because like, 
that were unsanctioned back then. Sixteen. Oh. <laughs> was there headgear <laughs> in New South ago. Wales then? Yeah, probably like a decade ago now. Yeah. Yeah, right. and so like. I don't know. It, it's, I think it, it does come back to like this point. Yeah, it, it becomes your your identity, right? But I think like mm-hmm. it's funny because again, I was having a conversation with like one of our newer foes about this the other day, and like it was Rosie actually um, was just listening to me kind of like give my take on this, and she was like, "You would be like so much better off if you listened to yourself." <laughs> like, <laughs> like, is it like I think, the, but I think the most important thing to learn as a fighter is that, like, it takes this, like, incredible to fight at a high level, or like, you know, high, mm. even, you know, like within Australia to fight at a high level to fight like the top yeah. fighters takes an incredible level of drive and discipline and focus. And, and obsession is probably a word to put it, but yeah. regardless, you are not what you do. No, you, you are you, you, are, but it's like, we feel like as fighters, there is this thing where we like, it's almost, you know, like, we, like you look at fighters, like social media feeds and it's almost like they're reluctant to show that they went to the fucking movies with their friends or something like that. It's like, it's yeah. almost this, this cool thing that like all I ever do is, and like, we as I'm guilty of it as much as anyone else. We perpetuate this idea that Mm-hmm. newer fighters follow that like it's got to be like i wake up and i go for a run and i do a thousand push-ups and then yes i, I live and breathe this yeah 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 where is this like there's i look now and i definitely when i was young like shane remember when i was like young i was like that like i didn't have a thought that was about anything but tie boxing for yes try like they'd be like you're going to understand when you're a bit older that this is not healthy. Like you don't get it now. <laughs> like you're getting like, I'm a bit older now. and I just... <laughs> Now you get it. Yeah. And it probably yeah. took till now that it's like, I wish now. Cause like, I can't like, I sometimes genuinely struggle to do anything else. Like I just go, okay, mm. I'm take a day off. That would be good for my mentor. And I'm like, Okay. And then you don't know what to do with yourself. Yeah, yeah. What else have I got? And then it's also like, for, for, for me, like, I'm super lucky to have, you know, the network that I do across Thai boxing, stuff like that. But when my phone rings to talk about Thai boxing, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> like, it's, and that's really cool, but it can sort of contribute also to like, if you are starting to get a bit burnt out, it, it can start mm-hmm. to feel like you just sort of don't have that. And it's not like I, I, that's probably the problem for me is I never want to get away from it. But yeah, you burn out the same way. You almost have to be, because people would try, like when I was younger, Shane would try to be like, don't come to the gym tomorrow. Like mm. just don't, just go and do something else. I'd really think it'd be better for you to do that. And I did that. I didn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't keep them out. But it's hard because <laughs> that's someone else <laughs> telling you, right? Like um, that's an external, you know, force telling you. It's not you making that decision on your own. Yeah. And then, then it's so like- sometimes if you're the type of person that if someone tells you what to do, you it will make if someone tells me what to do, I want to do the opposite. So yeah. 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 <laughs> so then you were probably just like, no, everyone wants me to, I don't know what they're talking about. They want me to yeah. calm down and stop. But then you're like, nah, love it. Yeah. Um, and I actually noticed it with myself, especially in my like relationship. No, I noticed it in the Christmas break because I devoted 150% last mm-hmm. year to Muay Thai. Mm-hmm. And then I was in conversations with people that were not at all involved in Muay Thai. And I was like, oh, what do I we talk about yeah or i'd get a bit bored or not bored but just yeah um i wasn't as involved in the conversation like my mind would just drift off yeah and i was like oh okay i think the fact that i can't even hold a conversation with someone outside of muay thai properly without getting bored that means i need to give attention to other areas in my life yeah Yeah. (laughs) Cause there is so many people outside of Muay Thai. I have a lot of friends and family that support me and their life is not Muay Thai. So giving, you know, attention to the things that they care about or the things that they do um, is equally as important. I think. Still learning how the fuck to do that, but yeah. yeah. Me too. Me too. But I think (laughs) it's, it's an interesting, really interesting thing to kind of get your take on. Cause I know, um, uh, I know it's something that that a lot of, and it, it probably does tie into this idea that you, you've you been fighting for a while, but I, I kind of feel like with the move to, like, as you sort of went pro, you, you kind of switched the intensity, you know, yeah. like started being a lot more active and kind of took that yeah. big leap is that it has been like a 12-month shift from almost like from hobbyists to 
high end yeah. professional and, and that kind of trying to adjust to that. I can't mm-hmm. imagine it's easy because, mm-hmm. you know, uh, to, to come back to what we were discussing earlier, it's like I got to do it nice and slow, you know, over the course of mm. I got to have 20 amateur fights, you know, before right. I went professional and, and got to kind of ease in. But, but uh, you know, female fighters often due to just the, the size of the talent pool often don't have that luxury. Yes. Yeah. Um, I did. I think I experienced some sort of like, would it be a hangover? Like the only, that's the only way I can really describe it is because you're going like, you're so yeah. focused on this one thing. Like I actually, I paid, I'm really lucky. I don't know how my partner Verge is still with me, honestly, because I really neglected a lot of things at home because I was just so focused on that. Shout out Virgil. He's, he's a really good dude. Shout out to Virge, <laughs> top tier <laughs> boy. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's met him. He's also another really tall human. He is very um, tall. Very, very tall, yeah. I still get like, because he's really like gentle and like he's not like big and clunky, even though he's super tall. So, like in the apartment, if I just turn around and he's there, I'm like, (laughs) (laughs) the sheer size of him. Um, Luckily, he's so he's really involved in sport, uh, basketball. Yeah. He was at like really high level basketball. Yeah. Filipino and tall. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So he, it was really cool because I had someone that understood what it takes to dedicate to your sport, but it wasn't the same sport. So it wasn't like I was going home, like to Muay Thai, to more Muay Thai. Like I had someone that had been in the sports field, but I didn't have to, I could zone out and switch off from Muay Thai. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I was just really lucky that he got that. Like, I, I honestly don't know how. <laughs> He was so supportive and he still, he loves watching Muay Thai. He loves watching like my pad work. Like he came to Muay Thai League and he fucking loved the all-female card. He was so excited. Yeah, um, we were hanging out on the table. Yes, the two tall boys ringside. <laughs> I'm not that tall. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone that hasn't met you yet listening to this would be like, man, that massive guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, so he... He really helped me keep my shit together, as well as just yeah, the, the the support network at um SRG Lewis. Like he's lived all of this, like everything that we're going through as fighters, he's lived it. So yeah, he's really easy to talk to about these things and give advice. Um, but yeah, I did experience that. I don't know what it was. I guess you could call it a hangover or like a come down. Yeah. Um of just giving everything yeah. and then that, that was when I looked around at my life and I was like okay this is amazing but I can't do that again I, I can still achieve I've created the momentum now yeah for my fight career and I will still give 110 percent in training and I will give all the love but I also need to give that love to other aspects of my life because yeah yeah that's what happens a, when I retire I am going to retire at some point I've I, I want to have a good foundation to retire with as well. Yes. And yes. be like, oh, wow, Dory, like, okay, she fucked everyone off just to be like a world champ. Then I'm a world champ alone with my fucking trophy and just broken bones. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's like my worst fear, I think, that I, this visual that I have of myself, like I've got all this, all this bling, but like I just forgot about all the people that cared about me. I don't know. I don't know why. Maybe I watched. No, many, no, I get, I get that absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, like what is success worth if it comes at, at the expense of, of all other aspects of life, right? Yes, yes. But yeah. To, to switch gears slightly, because um, yeah, got um onto a lot some really really good discussion points there uh, i think we're probably gonna have to have you back as a repeat guest but I, before we run out of time with you i do want to touch on your upcoming fight of course it'd be um, oh, yeah. a waste not to chat about that you're up on the big eruption card in a week against yeah. um a queensland favorite erin harberger don't think i've seen her on the scene for a while i think this is something of a comeback, comeback fight for her but, i think but so yeah really highly touted especially as a junior like when she was mm. I, I remember her mm-hmm. coming up at about 16 years old being really really impressive so talk us through the match how's your preparation going what can we expect from this one um as part of what is a sweet card yeah i'm so stoked to be on eruption like you know this is i guess um the first opponent I've had that is really, really, really experienced, not like same experience as me, you know? So yeah. I'm very excited at that. Um, 
you know, the old me a year ago would have been scared at that, yeah. you know, but now I'm like, oh, fuck yeah, this person has way more experience. Like this is just going to, it's, I'm going to see another version of myself in the mm. fight now because she's going to push me to new levels. Like this fight, we're going to push each other. Yeah. yeah. It's like a win-win situation. Yeah. Yeah. Way. Yeah. And on a really good show, I think we're the only female fight as well um, on that card. It's been a, yeah, a little bit of a shortage. Mm. A little bit of a shortage. Because there. Nakia n- nabbed everyone for Muay Thai League in three months, in three weeks' <laughs> yeah. time. She's yeah. Quick, she's like very a... organized. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, you know, blessing and a curse, eh? But it's, um, <laughs> yeah. Kind of the next gen starts to sort of come out soon and mm-hmm. start to fill some of these cards. Yeah. 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 But I am really, um, this one's been a bit of a different energy, I feel, because I'm like, all right, eruption, like, this is it. Like, it's a big, yeah, it's the biggest it's a show, show, I would say. Yeah. yeah, it's a really cool show to fight on. You'll, you'll really enjoy it. Yeah, so you had to meet Uncle Paul as well. Uncle Paul, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I haven't met, yeah, I haven't met anyone, um, I guess involved with that show. Yet, yeah, really. you'll love it up there. It's such a cool experience. Mm. They do a great job with the show. Yeah, yeah it looks done yeah. really well. Nice, excellent. So, I just like you know, because we're on deep personal, I got a deep personal question for yourself. Deep what? personal, I feel like okay. it's going to be the opposite because you've prefaced it saying that what's your top three favorite animes oh yeah good one okay <laughs> um i don't know if you can see but the only poster i have in my house is an attack on titan one there on the I set. <laughs> um okay so attack on titan bleach i'm only allowed three um, uh, we only Dragon... got short time. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Dragon Ball Z, because of like when I think we're all similar generation, but like waking up, mm. cheese TV, watching Dragon Ball yeah. Z before cheese school. TV, geez, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a bit. My parents were a bit concerned because, like, you know, when you're a kid, you just draw all the mm. time because we didn't have iPads, and all I drew was Dragon Ball Z, and it was just all like ripped, muscly men. And my parents were just kind of like, oh, um, do we need to have like a talk with her yet about the birds <laughs> and the bees? Or like, and I was like, no, nah, I just fucking, I want to be these dudes, you know? They're just so sick. <laughs> but yeah, they're my top three. And fun fact on the treadmill, usually I'm listening to anime well, opening someone takes it. songs. Yeah, well, fuck this week. It's been a lot. Been a lot of people. <laughs> I think I've just invited more people to take it, actually. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's all that did, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, so when I'm running, if I'm not listening to a podcast, I'm listening to anime opening songs. Because they're just so, you know, they're oh, yeah, inspiring, man. They just say, yeah, they are. They are their own little rocky montages. <laughs> they're all little rocky montages, exactly. What what are your what are your what do you watch? Oh, uh, like my Only recent three. list, uh, One Punch yeah, yeah. Man, oh, um, yeah. My Hero Academia, and mm. Chainsaw Man. <laughs> okay, My Hero Academia is good. That one's a good fight camp one. <laughs> yeah, it is. So if you want triumphant stories of people coming overcoming obstacles, yes, that's your you go to. <laughs> yeah, and they're training. They're trying to be superheroes. So awesome. yeah, that's what it's all about. <laughs> Not to segue from the nerd shit, but um. <laughs> Dory, we did say we'd get you out of here on a certain time. And mm. this is my fault, but um, I just think we got, like, you know, yeah. sometimes I just get stuck in on the show. I really enjoyed this episode. Um, mm. I, I'll Me have too. to go back and listen in because um, a lot of insights from yourself as a, you know, like, like I like doing this show because I just get to kind of just shoot the shit with high level fighters such as yourself and lots of kind of takeaways and, and some good discussion points. That, like I think a lot of the listeners will, take a lot away from that. And I think I've just off of this conversation, I've, I've got different ideas for, for things that I think are worth a little bit more detail. So really appreciate your time on this one. Oh, thank um, you. Before we do go, always want to give you the chance, any kind of supporters, anyone you want to give a quick shout out to um, while we're on. Oh man. Um, just my gym or my trainers. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I think I guess I, I talked about all the people that, yeah. Yeah, in the interview anyway. But yeah, as you mentioned, eruption in less than a week now. So I'm really, really stoked for that. And I'm fighting with my teammate Adam Singdam, yeah. who yes. is well known on the scene as well. So Team Thailand, we're going to Queensland. 
Yeah. So, so we'll share all the live stream info mm-hmm. um, on that. Make sure you watch. It's going to be a great car headlined, of course, by the rematch. James Sweet as Honey versus Jay the Ooh, Dingo Tonkin. Yeah, really looking forward to this. Yes. Um, tell the fans where they can find you. Where's what's the best place to reach you on social media and whatnot if they're not already? Uh yeah, so just dunk buns on Instagram, pretty much. Yeah. D-U-N-C-B-U-N-S. I actually don't remember why I came up with that name, but that's for the next interview. <laughs> <laughs> And any potential sponsors out there, support your girl. Oh, yeah. Buttons, for sure. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I guess that's all. Thank you. That was really fun. I feel like we need another three hours, Matt. Yeah. And and I'm down. Let's do it. So maybe I'll I'll, I'll do the send off today. Just, just a little. Right? I like just, I just it up. If you're listening. Um, you can support the show. Don't just listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. It helps us a lot if you actually hit subscribe and give us a rate. Um, helps you too because you get the episodes just delivered to your feed. Subscribe on YouTube too. And of course, the best thing you can do for us is tell a friend who will enjoy the episode. We produce many great conversations such as this one. I hope you enjoyed today. Thank you once again, Dora, for joining us. Very much looking Thank forward you. to Thank see you, you so fight much. next week. And to the listeners, until next time. Peace.